Hey guys, it's me and I'm playing 5 Minute. I was playing a Grandmaster not long ago and I got disconnected on move like 5 or 6 or something. <laughs> My computer shut down. So I lost a few points from that, but no big deal. I've got a game against Contorist. I'm going to play this like a dragon. Let's go for that sort of setup. Now, my development is great, but what to do from here? Let's go rook c8. I bet he'll play bishop d2, or maybe rook d1. Rook b1. I could play, hmm, I could play bishop e6 and try to route my knight to d7. Let's do that. Because I, I really want to get the knight to e7 in this position. A lot of times the knights uh, on c6 and this knight for white get traded in the middle, and then black can play the bishop to c6, but since his knight's out on f3, I don't think that's realistic for me. So we're going to do this plan instead. This allows me to go knight d4. I am going to take that opportunity. Maybe in conjunction with queen a5 soon. Stick with the pawn. If I play queen a5, I'd be threatening queen takes c3. The knight takes e2, but he'll surely defend against that threat, so I don't think I'll be able to exploit that. If he plays rook d1, I was debating whether I wanted to play e5 or not, so he plays that move instead. Hmm. Knight takes b5, I can play rook c3. Do we like that? I could also play knight takes e2 check. Knight takes e2, queen takes e2, a6. Would force knight a3. I think I like this move best of all. I want to pressure f2. So I'm going to see if he'll he'll take me on d4. So then I can do bishop takes d4, uh, queen to g3, and maybe knight f6. So he does that instead. Okay, let's just swap. We're going to trade queens. Because after queen takes b6, knight takes b6, if he takes on b5, I can get my rook into c2. I think I'm getting my rook into c2 no matter what. So I'm playing for a favorable endgame. Yeah, now rook in. Do I win a pawn here? Looks like it. He can't defend a2. Oh, he has that move. Forgot about that. Should I be super bold and bring my king up to uh, <laughs> e5? Eh, it's unfortunate he has that move. too bad. All right, I'm just going to take this. I'm going to lose the e6 pawn, but whatever. I'm going to go rook e2. One trick is that if he goes rook b to e1, I have rook takes f2. This rook takes f2. 
So I would expect him to play f3. Let's bring the king up now. His bishop is messed up, so I think I'm going to have a good opportunity to trade it favorably. Yeah, if bishop d5 or c4, I'm going to take it and try to attack whichever pawn ends up on d5 or c4. Yeah, let's take it and play rook c8. I'm going to do this just to defend my a7 pawn should he play rook a1. I have an advantage because it's not easy for him to shake my rook on the second rank. Also, my king is very active. Okay, now he can double, though. Still, I think I should do this. He can double in the A file and threaten my a7 pawn. But I'm totally totally willing to pitch that pawn if necessary. Let's go g5. Idea h5, h4 eventually. That's also nice because, okay, against this, just gotta figure out what to do. Let's go e6. My king is nice here. I want to do that so that when he takes, he's not going to hit my e7 pawn. Now he's really going to be worried about me doubling on the second rank. I'm giving him my h7 pawn. But once I double, you know, at the very least I'm drawing. But I think I'm, I'm going to try for more for sure. He'll probably attack my g-pawn in some capacity. Rook h5 or rook g7, probably rook h5. Plays h4. Okay, let's give it a check. check. <laughs> let's give check. another check. Let's check, check here. Let's go here. And then let's check, check again on this square and then take the g3 pawn. And let's take here. Likely that was good defense for him. Let's do this. I still have pressure, and I can often, Check. if I can trade a, one rook even, I like my chances. Check. Okay, be careful. Uh, be careful, John. Let's go here. This is really tricky. Okay, I'm going to avoid rook g8. I don't want that to happen. Check. Check. Let's do this. Check. Okay, he's going end game mode. Okay, now I can stop this pawn though. And my king is safe. King is very safe. Check. Lucina position. Here we come. <laughs> yeah, I get to show my endgame chops. <laughs> Check. Tom instructive. Very instructive. Now we get the king out. Check. March Check. our king up. Check. Promote. Yeah, Lucina position coming at you. 
let's go here. And then do the waiting move. Oh, one move from checkmate. <laughs> okay. Let's go back. That was a fun game. So it was a queen takes d4 line in the open Sicilian turned into a Meroxy bind, basically. What's interesting about this setup, I, I probably wasn't explaining the, the typical plan for black in the best way. So very often in these positions, there is a white knight on d4, white's queen is on d1, and white has like a bishop on e3. Okay, And at that point, the typical freeing plan for black is to trade the knights on d4 and then put this bishop on c6. Because the thing about black's setup, and I've seen this often from the white side because I have way more experience in this line from the white side, uh, this Meroxy bind, is that black has like one too many minor pieces. Um, these two pieces especially have a hard time coordinating together. And this knight in particular really wants to get to d7. So that's why the trade of knights and the bishop coming to c6 is so useful for black. It, it remo removes some of the um, congestion in this position. So in this current setup, my lack of experience in this line is sort of showing because it, it wasn't immediately clear to me how I should play. Maybe queen a5 is a decent move. But um, I just played a generic move, rook c8, and he played rook b1. If he plays b3 immediately, I have this tactic. So that might have been his reasoning behind rook b1. He just wants to avoid that. So rook c8, he did this, and I went to bishop e6. This strikes me as artificial, but I wasn't sure what to do, once again. Knight a5 doesn't look that great. I mean, I could play a6, perhaps. But the chances of me getting b5 in are not high. So let's just check what the engine suggests. It says queen a5, okay. With queen a5, what happens if bishop d2? Queen c5 offer a trade. Yeah, white maintains an edge. Let's turn this off. So I went bishop e6. He went b3. Knight d7. I don't think he should have gone for my bishop on e6. Because as you saw, that capture seemed to strengthen my influence on the center. I think he should just play bishop b2. And I was going to post the knight on c5. But more than likely, his eventual knight d5 move will result in some sort of an advantage for him. Let's just say, you know, here, let's say the bishops get swapped. I take this knight, which seems unavoidable in the long run. In these situations, it's usually best for white to take with the e-pawn and put long-term pressure on the pawn on e7. There's a game in the uh, 2013 World Championship, actually, between Carlsen and Anand, where this scenario happened with colors reversed. And Carlson was white, he had a pawn on e2, and Anand uh, was able to apply pressure to it. Even could have applied more pressure than what occurred in that game. I think that was game... What game was that? Three, I want to say? One of the earlier games. But anyways, I think he should have done that. I was not overly impressed by the knight g5 move, because that allows me into d4. I don't think I missed any tactics. Knight b5. I did pause for a while here. How much time did I spend on this move? Yeah, almost a minute. Probably too long, but there's there's options. I can take on b5 or e2, so I've got two forcing moves to consider. And also moves just defending the knight or you're trying to do something else. I wonder which one the engine prefers. I, I In retrospect, I like queen b6. Engine says... Check. This line is also good. Yeah, I looked at that because this knight is nearly trapped. He has to go to a3. Okay, some approach with knight c5. Good position for black, it seems. Yeah, because this knight is misplaced. So that's another option. Also hey guys, sorry about that. My recording software actually crashed as I was doing the analysis. So I'm going to try to splice these two clips together. But um, anyways, I skipped ahead to the end game. And I just wanted to go through a couple points briefly about this rook end game. Because um, this is a win for black, but I did not play it in the best way. You can see that we were both pretty low on time, so that's my excuse. <laughs> um, 
What do you guys think is the easiest way for Black to win this position? What's the way that will give him very little counterplay? Black to move. If you said rook g7, you are correct. I think this is the best way to do it. So just cut off his king. Then his king is not close enough to my pawn to really hassle me. And I can focus on escorting the pawn up the board with my king. But as played, I just started moving the king up. And this was still winning. Check. But I had to demonstrate some knowledge of the Lucina position that I was referring to, also known as the bridge position. And basically, the Lucina position is just a uh, position where the side with the extra pawn can win, and it's characterized by having the king in front of the pawn. So Check. when you get in, basically this situation. So black wants to win by getting the king out and then promoting the pawn. Hopefully win white's rook in the process. But... They can't do it right away because after king g2, and if we bring the king out, he has Check. all these annoying checks, right? And Check. we don't want to get too far away from our pawn Check. because if that happens, white can just come back and monitor the pawn. So what black has to do is build the bridge. And the best way to do it here, I actually played rook f5 immediately, but um, I should have played check. Check. <laughs> if I had thought about this for a half second more, I'm, I'm sure I would have played this. And... He's in trouble now because if he wants to stay close to my pawn with king f3, I can just slide my king over and I'm threatening to promote next move. And if he takes my pawn, I have rook f8 check, check king e3 check. here winning his rook in the game. So after this check, he would have been forced to go to the h file, let's say king h2. And now I put the rook on g5. For black, it's crucial to use the fifth rank. If white were the one with the extra pawn trying to promote, they'd be using the fourth rank. And that's like the perfect square because it's out of range of white's king, but it still allows me to eventually interpose with the rook, which is the whole idea of this rook lift. So for instance, let's say white plays a waiting move like rook e8. Black can bring the king out. And we're threatening to promote at all times, so white's check. defense is kind of forced. He must give check. Check. Now, here's the position where a lot of people mess uh, the method up. So, as black, you want to go either here or here with your king. No other move is good. So, let's say we choose f3. Um, he can give us another check. Check. But then we go to e4. We're still threatening to promote, so he's got a check. Check. And now rook e5. And black has built the bridge. Which... I've told my students this before, but <laughs> I don't know why they call this the bridge position, because to me, this looks more like a barrier than a bridge. But black lines everything up on the file, check. and you can see the importance of that initial check that black gave on g8 way back here. Because if that check had not been played, the white king is close enough. Let's say it was on g2. It'd be close enough to go and win the pawn now. But as it stands, he's one square too far. Uh, so the way I did it, though... When we got this position, I did not play rook g8. I played rook f5 just kind of instinctively because um, <laughs> I forgot to check. But it's still a win. It's just that let's say he had played rook e8. I would have had to move rook g5 check now. Check. Which actually might complicate things because um, if here, king f1 and then tick. Yeah, actually this is a draw at this point because check. if check, he can go like here or here and attack my rook. So I didn't do it in the best possible way. It's still a win for black, but I would have had to like probably move my rook back and check him uh, or found an alternative way. Like an alternative way actually would have been something like, let's say here, rook d5, cover the d file, then move my king, then promote. So he did this though. And then I brought my king out. He went here. Yeah, he actually should have checked me now. Check. And you see the problem, right? Because if this, check, check here, check. check again, here, and check. check. If I block with my rook now as planned, his king is closer check. than it was when I was demonstrating the proper technique. And he draws. So even these basic end games are easy to mess up. And I think it's a, it's a good illustration of why you really want to have it pretty much nailed down pat and practice many times. So that when you're in time pressure like this, you don't flub it like I do. <laughs> Even though I, I know this technique and I've seen it like a million times, I still messed it up. So 
As it stands, though, it was kind of a moot point because um, after king d2, he went king g4, and I brought my rook down. Now my rook is helping to uh, promote the pawn, and when he starts Check. checking me, I don't have to keep my king close to the pawn. I can just Check. start moving my king Check. back, and eventually he's going to have to go here and give up his rook for the pawn, which is what he did. Oh yeah, there's one other point I wanted to make. I think, backing up just slightly, right here, after king d2, does anyone know what the best defense for white would be? You can pause your video. What is the best way for white to gain counterplay? Or is white doomed? Well, probably I would have not have asked you that question if white was doomed. But if you said rook to a6 is the best way of getting counterplay, give yourself a pat on the back. That's a nice move. Um, so in these endings, it's um, they often partition the board into the short side and the long side. So the short side would be this side of the pawn. There's less squares that way. And the long side would be this side of the pawn. Okay. So you always want your king on the short side of the board and your rook on the long side of the board when you're trying to defend an ending like this because that gives you maximum checking distance, meaning the distance between the white rook and the black king is greater than if white had played like this, for instance. So by playing rook a6, I actually think he's drawing this position because, yeah, he sets up these lateral checks. And I won't get into too much theory about why this is a draw, but just one illustrative variation is if e2, check. rook a2 check, um, if I try to move my king up like this, he keeps checking check. me. And I don't think I have anything good because in order to escape the checks, I'd either have to come at his rook, after which he can swing it over and pick up this pawn. Or if I try to be tricky and go here, he check. just keeps checking me. Check. Yeah, and eventually check. there's nothing to be done. Check. check. If I go to the back rank, he can... Just check. check. Yeah, and even if this move, I think it's still a draw. Check. Yeah, just check. If the king ever crosses to the f-file, then king f2 wins the pawn. So there's no way for me to get this done. If he does anything other than check, though, check. Um, I might be able to play rook f1 and promote the pawn. So like, if ever he plays, I don't know, rook a1, let's say, then rook f1 is winning. So... If you're trying to defend this position, you're you're down the pawn, your opponent has your king cut off, and your opponent also has their king in front of the pawn. Just remember that your best defense is to go to the long side with your rook, keep your king on the short side, and try to administer side checks. I mean, he, he played the very natural check. move, rook d6 check, because as you can see, the time is getting super low once again. Check. But now it's losing again, I believe, for him. Yeah. Although, you could actually still play this here. Is that any different, though? It's a little bit different, because now I can go rook here, perhaps. But I won't get into that. But anyways, that's just what I wanted to say about this rook endgame. Um, if you have any questions about this particular rook endgame, please let me know. And hope you guys enjoyed this one. I'll be back with another video shortly, so talk to you guys later. Bye.